involved shooting that occurred at the parking lot of the Springfield Town Center. Following that, Chief Davis is going to come out and take some questions. Uh, for those of you who are viewing at home online, uh, we're going to post the entire press conference in its entirety online to include the body-worn camera footage you're about to see and also the full body-worn camera footage. Christian Parker, 37, of Reston, stole a firearm from the home and pointed the weapon at a relative. Parker then discharged the firearm inside the home and left with the firearm. No one was injured at the time of the reckless discharge. An officer obtained warrants for possession of a firearm by a felon, larceny of a firearm, brandishing a firearm, and discharging a firearm within a home. On June 30th, detectives from our Fugitive Track and Apprehension Unit learned Parker was in the area of the Springfield Town Center and notified officers from our Summer Crime Initiative team. Officers found Parker's car, and shortly thereafter, he returned to his car. When he returned to his vehicle, the officers coordinated a stop to prevent Parker from fleeing in his vehicle. He's 
slumped over. Do we have a shield? We get a shield here. He's moving. discharged their firearms a combined eight times, striking Parker six times. The stolen firearm was located inside the car.
Good afternoon. There's a couple thoughts and comments I want to share before we get into the Q&A, so please, please bear with me. Police chiefs in 2022 are now afforded the opportunity to respond to officer-involved shooting scenes and immediately review body-worn camera footage. That's a good thing for our community and a good thing for our police officers. There now exists an absolute expectation that police chiefs do two things that we never before were afforded the capacity to do. Number one, provide an assessment regarding the performance and conduct of police actions in real time. And number two, publicly release body-worn camera footage to the community and media in a timely manner. Late in 2021, we developed and released a gold standard release of information policy that mandates we share body-worn camera footage within 30 days of an officer-involved shooting. My initial, and preliminary, my initial and preliminary assessment, one that our community expects, and this very follow-up release of body-worn camera footage, one that community accountability demands, will always happen before the conclusion of the criminal and administrative investigations. The natural question then is to what extent, if any, do these various releases impact the validity of our concurrent criminal and administrative investigations? That's not lost on me or, frankly, any other police chief in America. What police leaders across the nation know, however, is that community trust depends on both the timely leadership assessment and thorough investigation processes. The two are not mutually exclusive. I think it's also not lost on our community that we have embraced a gold standard use of force training called ICAT, I-C-A-T, Integrating Communications Assessments and Tactics. It's something that PERF developed, the Police Executive Research Forum, America's think tank of, of policing, developed back in 2015. And it encourages uh, many things, and, and it teaches many things. And we're in the process right now of delivering ICAT training to the Fairfax County Police Department. Um, one of the things it encourages is for police officers to be trained in using time and distance to our advantage and to the advantage of the person that we're interacting with. And as it pertains to time and distance, there's now an expectation that we train to that police officers, when it's feasible, tactically reposition themselves so they can more safely deal with a person who's in crisis. So a lot of the conversations that have come up recently kind of compare and contrast uh, this incident that you just saw uh, to a couple other incidents that really have just occurred in, in the last several days. Uh, one was a man who took his own life on the Fairfax County Parkway. Uh, this man was, was armed with a firearm, and we were able to close the roadway in both directions. We were, we were able to tactically reposition our police officers. We were able to get a helicopter up in the air to see what was going on. We were able to put a drone in the air to get close so we could see what he was doing, and we were able to get a negotiator on the telephone to have a conversation with this man while he was in crisis and armed with a gun. Uh, that environment, that environment afforded us the opportunity to use time and distance to our advantage, and we did. And you may recall just a couple days before that, there was a suicidal man on the GW Parkway who was armed with a knife. Uh, our officers shut down the GW Parkway in both directions and negotiated successfully with this man to drop the knife and come out, and we were able to sa safely take that man into custody and get him the help that he needed. What's different about this officer-involved shooting is that this event, as you just saw, occurred in a very crowded, busy shopping center parking lot. And there were many civilians, most of whom were completely oblivious to the fact that three uniformed Fairfax County police officers were even act interacting with a man in a car armed with a firearm. They just didn't know. But there were many, many civilians who were walking right by this 
scene as it unfolded. And you may have heard or you'll hear when you further review the, the video that our officers were actually telling people to get back and to go and walk in a, in a different direction. Um, thankfully, no civilians were hurt, but our, the person involved in this incident, if we were to have backed up, if we, were have, if we would have tactically repositioned ourselves, retreated, uh, it would have afforded him an opportunity to do a number of different things that would have been very, very dangerous to the community at large. He could have got out of the car, he could have carjacked someone, he could have taken someone hostage, he could have run inside the mall with a firearm and done a lot of damage. And now all of a sudden we have an active shooter on our hands. So our police officers in this particular scenario made the right decision, in my opinion, uh, not to tactically reposition themselves because it would have afforded this, this gunman an opportunity to either get out of the car and potentially do a lot of harm to a lot of innocent folks and or use his car as a battering ram and make his way out of the parking lot. And now what we have is a 3,500-pound missile that's flying through a crowded parking lot on a sunny afternoon. So I wanted to speak to that a little bit because I anticipate that will be a couple questions. We take it very seriously. We take the loss of life very seriously. Um, this is something we, we train to. Um, I think our investigative processes, both our Major Crimes Bureau and our Internal Affairs Bureau, conduct these investigations thoroughly and in a, in, in, in a manner consistent with community expectations. Our relationship with the Commonwealth Attorney's Office, Steve Descano and his team, is seamless. Uh, we share information constantly with the Commonwealth Attorney's Office with all these, all these critical events. So I, uh, I'll take some questions now. Amari. Thank you. Um, are the officers who are involved still on restricted duty or are they back on they're, they're still in a, um, they're not relieved of duty, but they're assigned administratively while this investigation is still uh, taking its course. And, and that's a routine, routine procedure. And another thing, Amari, that you and your, your peers will probably note is that this is our, fir our fourth, rather, our fourth officer involved shooting of 2022. Fairfax County, in spite of serving 1.2, 1.3 million people, we, for the last decade, have only averaged about 1.5 police-involved shootings a year. In fact, last year in 2021, we only had one, and one's too many. But here we are in 2022, and we've had four. And in and, and our assessment, uh, three of the four involve people who are in, in crisis, mental health crisis, behavioral crisis. So that's not lost on us either. But long answer to your question, the, the officers are on an amended duty status while, they, while this investigation runs its course. Yes, ma'am. And, and that was kind of one of the points of my, uh, my, my statement there, to, to address some of the concerns, uh, whether it's me or another police chief locally or nationally. Uh, I, I know, and, and again, I'm not going to speak for the community or the media, but you saw the video. I think the video speaks for itself. Uh, we were interacting with a man who was armed with a, with a gun, and in spite of at least 30 demands to drop the gun, he never... He never did. And we're never going to know why. We just aren't. We can speculate all day long. Uh, but the officers were faced with a very dangerous situation, one that they couldn't turn and run from. There's no U-turns, and they're protecting the community. They're dealing with a person who's armed and dangerous, and they're in a crowded shopping center parking lot filled with mothers, fathers, and, and children. Uh, some of the still pictures that we captured involved moms and dads literally carrying their toddlers across the parking lot uh, from the, the mall to their, to their car. So our, off our officers were faced with a, a very dangerous situation. Uh, I think they were brave. I think they acted lawfully and in compliance with our policies and community expectations. It's never um, watching the use of force on a video or seeing it in person, it, it's never pretty, you know, especially when someone's life is lost. So we realize that and we take it seriously. And uh, this young man, 37 years old, no stranger to the criminal justice system, I, I, I don't know what was going through his mind that day. I know we were out at his house a few days prior because he, 
he took his brother's firearm and he fired around inside of his parents' home. So um, obviously he was in some type of crisis, uh, but our interactions with him that day unfortunately led to a deadly use of force. And again, that's, um, that's very serious. And, and his, um, the fact that his life is lost as a result of it is, is profoundly sad. Bruce. Chief, um, I don't know what the standard is for justifiable, and we were looking at that. You could see him hold the, the gun up in the video, but there was a narrative that talked about him waving the gun around and pointing it in the direction uh, of the officers. Uh, I couldn't see it. Maybe if I looked at it again for my frame, I would. Um, what is the standard? Did he have to actually point the gun at your officers for them to be justified in opening yeah. fire? Well, the, the legal standard, uh, Bruce, does not require a person to actually point a firearm at a police officer before a police officer makes a decision to use deadly force. Police officers use deadly force when they believe that their lives or the lives of others are uh, imminently threatened, uh, serious bodily harm or death. So the officers who discharged their firearms made that assessment. Now, some folks will say you, you asked him to drop his gun 30 times. Why couldn't you ask him 40 times or 50 times? I think the officers really showed a lot of restraint, and they're begging him to drop his gun, and, and, he, just, and he just doesn't. Uh, and a firearm in someone's possession, even if it's held in a manner that's not pointing at another human, uh, action is faster than reaction, and I can point it at you a whole lot faster than you can react to it. So we train to that. Um, so it's, it's, the, it's what the officer perceives at the time, and that perception is based on whether their lives are in danger, the lives of others are in danger, and, and I think our officers did the very best they could. Again, these officers didn't wake up that day expecting to be involved in this scenario, and, and I think they really did a lot to encourage him, order him, to, to drop his gun, and, and he just didn't, Bruce. And did he actually point it in their direction? Well, what you don't see on the video, because videos, you know, and I always find myself when I watch a video, I'm leaning to the left and leaning to the right, because I want to see more, and I'm sure you all will feel like you're in the same boat, but what our video shows is that uh, this gunman was in possession of a firearm, a semi-automatic pistol, and he had it in his hand, in his possession, and uh, you know whether or not it was being in, or in the process of uh, uh, being directed at the officers or pointed at the officers or, or possessed in a manner that was otherwise threatening, uh, our investigation is still sorting through all those things. Uh, but the mere possession of a deadly weapon, a firearm in this case, just feet away from uniformed police officers in a crowded shopping center, uh, I think it's objectively reasonable to consider that person a, a very dangerous, uh, very dangerous to not just the police officers, but to the shoppers and passerbyers and, and civilians. It could have been a, a much, much more dramatic situation if he got out of that car with a gun. Paul. So, Paul, if there was such a thing as chalkboards, I'd, I'd, chalk, I'd draw it here. So what you see initially is the uh, in-car video. So Fairfax County police officers not only have body-worn cameras, but we also have in-car cameras, in-car videos that are on the front dash. And that initial piece of the video footage you see is a uniformed Fairfax County police officer in an unmarked car blocking in this gunman from the rear. And then you also see simultaneous to him pulling up in the parking lot and blocking this person in from the rear as you see another uniformed uh, Fairfax County police officer in an unmarked car block him from driving out, uh, you know, to, to the other side. So that, that's what you see, and that's an in-car video. And then the rest of the videos that you see are the body-worn cameras attached to the police officers. Well, yes, sir? My, my question is, the wide angle, it's hard to tell. That car with the dash camera... He couldn't have backed up. That car was backed up. I mean, that car was pulled in tight so that he couldn't back up either. Well, there's a, well, there's a real...
call, there's typically a way. And just because there's a police car in front of or behind an offender's vehicle, if that offender is in possession of that car and he makes an effort to escape by ramming into police cars, we've seen that all too happen in the, in the DMV uh, over the years. I know you've probably seen it. Um, but it certainly is preventive in nature. It certainly pre presents an obstacle for that person to escape from that parking spot, but it's no sure thing. Yes, sir. So you uh, mentioned in your comments that there were children and families at the mall. It was a crowded time of day. Uh, how was the decision made that there and that moment was the time your police were going to interact with this person who you said was familiar with law enforcement? Well, I think I described our response to his parents' home a few days ago. And uh, based on that response, our detectives obtained arrest warrants for, for this person. Our fugitive team was in the process of attempting to locate him um, through various investigative techniques. They knew he was at uh, the, the shopping center, and when that was communicated to our summer crime initiative police officers who were in the area, uh, because they were closer, they obviously made an effort to, to apprehend him. Best case scenario, we get him before he even gets in that car. So the, the goal of the, or one of the goals rather, of apprehending him was for him not to go mobile. Uh, we don't want to get in a situation where we're chasing someone in a car because then exponentially more people are in danger. So our goal, you see him outside of the car, was to apprehend him while he was still not yet behind the wheel. We tried that. You saw him quickly jump back in the car. Then we made a decision, obviously, to block him in. We didn't want him to go mobile. As soon as he goes mobile, many more people are at risk. Uh, and that was the, again, and all these things happen very, very quickly. Um, and, and I think the police officers, again, did the best they could. They were in a very dangerous situation. Karen Campbell. Um, thank you. Uh, Chief Davis, I have two questions. And one is kind of a follow-up on what you just said. So what was the reasoning why apprehending him, Mr. Parker, at the mall instead of, you know, some uh, another time during the day? Why at the mall? Well, Karen, again, thank you for meeting with me a few days ago, and thank you for being here today. Um, when we obtain a arrest warrant for someone, particularly someone who's wanted now for a, a violent crime, a felony that involves the possession and discharge of a firearm, it's an absolute priority of the Fairfax County Police Department to take that person into custody because he remains a danger to himself and his family and others. So it was a priority for us to find him and apprehend him. Uh, when we found him and knew he was in the vicinity of the uh, shopping center, it was a um, decision to take him into custody, or at least attempt to take him into custody, before he got back in this car. Now, I understand with the benefit of hindsight, folks can say, well, why didn't you wait uh, another week, or why didn't you find out, find or attempt to discover another way to take him into custody? Um, and, and those are all fair questions, but the decision the police officers made to attempt to take him into custody before he got behind the wheel of that car was, I think, a sound decision. And it's something our fugitive detectives and police officers do every day. Uh, right now, during this press conference, there is a Fairfax County police officer taking a wanted person into custody in probably a parking lot, uh, in, in a home. Um, it, it happens in, in all sorts of locations, and we really try our best in, to make decisions so we do those things um, as safely as possible. And then, I, just a follow-up. Yes, ma'am. Um, the video show started um, just a, a mo few moments before Mr. Parker approached the car. How long was it um, before he approached the car that the police officers were in the parking lot? And was that enough time to start clearing all of the... Uh, pedestrians and um, everybody that was within close proximity to that car, yeah. uh, to the car. So as I think I understand your question, Karen, it was a crowded parking lot, no, no doubt about it. It was just a couple minutes because the officers had a description of Mr. Parker. They had a description of the vehicle he was driving. And when they found his car um, that obviously, and you saw the video, was not yet occupied by Mr. Parker, then they saw him. And when they saw him, he was on foot, but he was heading to his car. So now these police officers are making a decision uh, to take him into custody before he gets back in his car and behind the wheel. But we were in the parking lot 
Um, and again, we were, our police officers were being directed by the fugitive detectives who were not on site, um, and, and they were directing us where to attempt to locate the car and Mr. Parker. Okay. And then my final question is, um, I appreciate you uh, releasing this video. Um, when will you be releasing the raw uh, uh, dash cam and body cam video? Uh, of this incident, Karen, yes. that, that's all going out today. Okay. Yeah. Just for the sake of this press conference and, and everyone's time, uh, we've we've compiled it in this manner, um, but we'll release everything today. Chief, um, is the family seeing this video? Yes. So we think we're. Um, and, and let's really speak to the family. So you know, we're, I think we're really careful and thoughtful with. Uh, you know, showing folks who are definitely going to be impacted by seeing this video, because that's another consideration that. You know, this dynamic didn't even exist when I became a police chief, let alone a police officer. So this is a new dynamic introduced to uh, American Police Department. So we, we share the video with the, the family of the person, um, Mr. Parker. Uh, we share the video with our own police officers. Um, anyone who we think could be impacted or traumatized or, or potentially triggered by this video, we do our best to uh, sit down with those folks and show them the video. Can you say when they saw it? When the Parker family saw it, they, they saw it before this press conference. I'm not sure exactly when. I don't know if it was today, yesterday. Or... Okay, I'm looking to my left. Yesterday. yesterday. Right. And secondly, uh, was there a supervisor there on the scene uh, before the shooting took place? Was, there a, was, that, was that a group of officers? You said it was a summer crime initiative. Yep. Is, is that a, a, like a group of officers that work with the supervisor, like sergeant or lieutenant? So, Paul, I wish we had a police department, as does every other police chief in America, that had a one-to-one -one officer to supervisor ratio. Um, but none of the three officers in involved had a rank above master patrol officer. I would describe them as all vet uh, veteran police officers. Uh, obviously, supervisors, commanders, detectives, crime scene detectives, um, and, and others uh, responded to the scene after it occurred. And you can see with, it's only a matter of 12 seconds that our police officers are, are calling for fire and rescue to respond to the scene. And it's, it's not lost on me, nor do I expect it's lost on you, the, the efforts that those police officers made to, to render aid uh, to, to the person that was shot. Um, they didn't, you know, they first had to contend with the fact that you know, he may be still armed and alive and in a position to to use that firearm, so once they kind of got through that and got enough police officers there safely, you can see how they broke out the window of the door that was locked, and, and they took him out and, and attempted to save his life. Bruce. Chief, um, at the time that they actually opened fire, there were three officers on the scene, and I, is your policy is to release those, they, their names, correct? Have you done that so far? Yeah, the, the policy is to release the names of the two police officers who discharged, and we have released those names. And, and, and so there were three officers on scene at the time that the two officers discharged their firearms. Right. Two, then, two of the three discharged, Bruce, and, and one did not. And, um, I mean, it seemed like within a very short time you had many more than three officers on scene. We did. We had not only additional police officers on the scene, you know, anytime an officer involved shooting happens, um, you're going to get police officers responding to the scene, you're going to get fire and rescue responding to the scene, supervisors, commanders, detectives. We have an incident, incident support system and peer support system uh, that responds to the scene as well. So it, it's a, and it should be, and it should be a large response to um, the, the most um, scrutinized thing that we do is use deadly force, do and you, it should be. Do you, by the time, I mean, maybe more detail than you have, but when he was removed from the vehicle, it looked like maybe there were as many as a dozen officers on the scene at that point, do you know? Um, well, by the looks of the video, there were several officers on the scene. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Heather. I knew that, Heather. I'm sorry. I knew, if I called you anything but Heather, I'd be in trouble. <laughs> yeah. um, in the very beginning of the video, when we see the patrol car first pulling up, the in-car video, it looks like um, Mr. Parker is bending down near the back tire or reaching something. Do you, do you know what he's reaching for? Or yeah. What are we seeing that moment? So, so Heather, that, one of my first observations was, what's he doing by the left rear tire? I don't know. I don't know that we know yet. That's something that our investigation might be able to address. Uh, I don't know what he's doing near that rear tire. He's doing something. Uh, I don't know what it was. 
but when he apparently sees or seemingly sees the the police car approach him, Heather, that's when I think, and I think it's relatively clear, he makes a decision to quickly get inside that car. Uh, and that's when the other police car blocked him in from the front. Got it. And Manny, you spoke briefully about how several of the uh, officer-involved shootings this year have involved people in crisis. Yeah. What is being done to perhaps change the approach you guys are taking on calls with the people who are potentially in crisis or dealing with mental health issues? Yeah. It's, it's a national question. It's the co-responder approach to mental and behavioral crisis. And we're in phase one now of our co-responder program. We're about to go into phase two. Uh, we work collaboratively with our community services board. Uh, they uh, are hiring clinicians. Uh, those clinicians will be in police cars uh, with our police officers. Again, it won't be a one-to-one -one ratio, but as we get into more and more phases of our co-responder program and approach, there will be several more co-responder teams available throughout uh, the county to respond to these scenarios. Um, you know, there, there's a, a lot of departments across the country that, that are taking on this necessary endeavor. Uh, it's important to do. And, and I think by the time we, we get further along into our co-responder program and approach, uh, we'll do it as, as well as anybody in the country. Would it's necessary. Would a co-responder be on this type of call? A co-responder on this type of call may be uh, on or near the scene, but where there's a deadly weapon involved, particularly a firearm, uh, we wouldn't necessarily expose that clinician. To, to that level of danger, but I'll, I'll use an example I, I touched on earlier. Uh, we had an, a person negotiating with an armed gunman on the Fairfax County Parkway just a few days ago via telephone. So there's a number of different ways, if we have the opportunity and, and, and the time and the capacity to put a clinician or a negotiator in touch with someone who's in crisis. Uh, this particular scenario, I don't think, um, you know, lent itself to, to that, but co-responders, clinicians will be on a lot of scenes, but we have to keep them safe because if we can't keep them safe, they can't do their job. But Fairfax County is, is uh, an early adopter of co-responders and we, we intend to be an industry leader. And it's something that uh, police departments across the country are taking really seriously, Heather. Yes, sir. So there were a couple of minutes, or I don't know exactly how long, but between the shots being fired and when the person was taken out of the car for medical it sounded like in the video they weren't sure if he was still holding the gun, but we couldn't really see from the angle that was presented. Could you kind of walk us through what the, those couple minutes between treatment and the shots being fired looked like, and if the officers did the right thing in, in waiting those few minutes? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, it appears to me and that the officers, after they discharged their firearm, didn't know if the person was still alive or not, didn't know if he was still in possession of the firearm or not. Uh, they weren't able to see him clearly, so I think that's why they took a tactical approach to the vehicle, and we certainly train our officers to do just that. Uh, if you know someone may still be armed or is armed, uh, we don't want police officers, we don't want fire and rescue personnel, we don't want community members to rush up on someone who may still be armed and may still be in a mindset that he or she is going to do harm to other people. So I think their approach uh, was tactical. I think it was something we, we trained to. And when we got close enough to the vehicle, we had to break the window out that I think you saw because the door was locked. And then we uh, afforded life-saving uh, measures to try to to try to save his uh, save his life, and unfortunately, uh, that didn't work out. Amari, you mentioned earlier that his partner had taken his brother's firearm. Is the firearm that he stole the same one that he had in the vehicle? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Well, thank you all for coming. This is uh, again the, the loss of a life, whether it's a uh, domestic-related homicide or or an officer-involved shooting, um, or someone taking his or her own life is something that we take very seriously. Um, we take this one very seriously, and uh, we, we embrace this process, this still relatively new process of sharing body-worn camera footage with our community because we think it really is the first and necessary big step we need to take in building additional trust.
So thank you.